my name is Sara Arroyo and I will be presenting the International HPV Reference Center. But before doing that, I would like to congratulate Karina Eklund and thank you. We are celebrating today 30 years of hard work, dedication and excellence in HPV research. So congratulations and thank you very much. You know this is your center. The International HPV Reference Center was originally established in Germany in 1985 under the leadership of Dr. Ethel Michel de Villiers. And it was transferred to Joachim Dillner in 2012, well, to Karolinska under the leadership of Joachim Dillner in 2012. And this transfer did not occur just by chance. I see it as a long journey. Am I? Yes as a long journey towards quality and order in HPV research. Joachim was already standing up for this. There are some achievements or some milestones that I believe that led him the honor to lead this International HPV Reference Center. And I would like to highlight some of those. In 2006, as he, as he already said, the WHO appointed Joachim uh, Dillner's group as the Global HPV Reference Laboratory. In 2009, Joachim Dillner, together with a group of HPV experts that I have met many of them today, uh, held the International HPV Conference in Malmö, which I have to say that has been the largest conference for IPV so far, with more than 2,000 participants. So congratulations. I believe also that it was at this conference when Dr. Ethel Michel de Villiers contacted you, well, talked to you about the International Reference Center, and the transfer was done in 2012. So today we work both as the Global HPV Reference Laboratory of the WHO HPV LabNet and as the International HPV Reference Center. This long journey, one cannot walk alone especially in science, you always need someone. And who better to walk with or to run with <laughs> than with our HPV marathon runner, Karina. <laughs> she's done most of the job and she's, well, she does most of the job in the, and the work in the International HPV Reference Center. The HPV Reference Center has its own webpage where all the information and main services are well described. It's hpvcenter.se. The objective of the center is to support quality and order in HPV research. And it does so by providing four main services, which are confirmation of novel HPV types and assignation of HPV type numbers. The center acts as a deposit and it maintains and distributes reference clones. The center supports the International Animal Papillomavirus Center, and it also issues international proficiency panels for HPV genotyping. I will describe now each of these services in detail, starting with the first one, confirmation of novel HPV types and assignation of HPV type numbers. So how do we know that we have a novel HPV type, a putative novel HPV type? Well, the, those authors that believe they have it identified a novel HPV type, they should contact the reference center with, and the whole, sorry, the whole viral genome should be cloned and sent to the reference center together with the sequence. Here in the reference center, what we do is we confirm the DNA sequence and see that it really corresponds to a novel HPV type. We check the viability of the clones and if everything is correct and the, and the DNA sequence, sequence corresponds to, to a novel HPV type, we assign a new HPV type number and we post it immediately on our website. So when the authors send us the clones, well, the plasmids together with the sequence, how do we know that that sequence corresponds to a novel HPV type? Well, we do it by following the taxonomy rules. The classification of HPV types 
is based on nucleotide homology. That means that depending on how different or how similar two sequences are, we can classify them under several categories. We do not look at the whole genome sequence, but we look only, well only, at the L1 gene, which is around 1600 base pairs. The taxonomy of HPVs state that different genera within a family share less than 60% nucleotide identity. Different species within a genus share from 60 to 70% nucleotide identity and different genotypes within the species share between 70 to 90% nucleotide identity. That translates into whenever we get a sequence from any originating author and we compare it to all the sequences from the established types from the center, it can never ever be more than 90%. How do we do compare the sequences? We do it by blasting. So what we do is we take the L1 fragment from the whole sequence from the originating authors and we compare that L1 with all the L1 fragments from the established types in the reference center. We do, a, we do blasting and we, the results will look something like this. Here we can see that the top hit corresponds to human papillomavirus type 94 complete genome. What we have to look at is that number. 84.54%, that's under the column of identity. Remember that I said that it has to be lower than 90% if we, if we are seeing a novel HPV type. So with this number, now we can confirm that the sequence that we have corresponds to a novel HPV type, but still there is some more work to do. Once we have confirmed this sequence, we do, I'm saying we, and it's Karina who does that, but well, the, the reference center does a recloning. We do a recloning re of the plasmids and we do a resequencing of the L1 fragment again. We send that, well, we do Sanger sequencing, which is the gold standard method. And um, that sequence that we get from Sanger sequence is compared from the sequence from the authors to see that it's identical. That has to be 100 identical. That is just to confirm that we have what the authors claim to have identified. So if everything is correct, all the sequences are identical and we have seen that they are novel and we have recloned all the plasmids so we know that, the, that, it, that they are viable. We can confirm, we assign an HPV type number and we post it on the website immediately. If we go to the website under the human reference clones tab, this is what we can see. We have all the HPV types that are officially established. You can also find information about to which genus and species they belong to, the gene bank ID accession numbers that are already linked to the gene banks. So you can maybe get information about this FASTA sequences and so which date they were submitted to the reference center, who submitted them, and the reference. If we scroll down, we can go down to the last number, which today, and I made sure that Karina didn't work extra, is HPV 226. So as so of today, we have up to 226 HPV different genotypes. Uh, however, four of them uh, were withdrawn due to mostly reclassification as subtypes and two of them are under investigation. So to be accurate, we can say that today we have 220 different HPV, that HPV types that are officially established. This is a phylogenetic tree showing almost all the officially established HPV, HPV types. I am missing the last one. But here I wanted to, to show in colors because it's a clearer maybe to see how the HPV types from gamma, well, how gamma genus is the largest one, followed by alpha, beta. We only have three genotypes comprising the new genus and one genotype in nu. Before the year 2000, there were only 85 HPVs that were officially established. After the introduction of real PCR, 
as I have seen today, and advances in degenerated primers, next generation sequencing, and using of uh, using unbiased approaches, those that are not based on PCR amplification, and and those that enable us to to um, to detect things without prior knowledge on what we are going to to sequence. Today we have up to 226 HPV types. And surprisingly, most of the genotypes that have been established so far belong to the gamma genus, which is now surpassing both alpha and beta. Before 2000, we, th there were only five genotypes corresponding to gamma. In the last five years, we have received 28 different types that have been officially established, 24 belonged to the gamma genus. We received one genotype belonging to the Mu genus. No other Mu virus had been found since 1991. And uh, from the new genus that we, where we only have one HPV genotype that is established, nothing has been received. And that was identified in 1987. But how many HPVs are out there? Well, it's more than 226 for sure. In the HPV center, we have more than 350 putative novel HPV types sequenced. Some, pap well, some papers and, and studies that we have done, like Salava, not Surav, but David <laughs> et al, uh, had detected no less than 229 putative novel types when doing metagenomic sequencing in skin samples. And we have also been, a we were also detecting novel HPV types when sequencing HPV negative condylomas. So the number is big, but all those sequences, they were not cloned and, though, and thus they are not established as new types, like officially established as new types. The number might be big, but we, of course, we cannot ascertain or give an exact number of how many HPV types are out there. The second main service that the International HPV Re Reference Center provides is the deposition, maintenance, and distribu distribution of reference clones. Since the Reference Center was moved to KI, Karina has provided 569 plasmids to 76 different labs located in 23 different countries. She works worldwide. Most of the requested types are, of course, the oncogenic types, together with HPV6 and 11. They were requested, well, from 14 to 23 times from different laboratories. However, other HPVs, such as HPV5 and HPV8, were requested from 10 different laboratories. And, it, and it's a total of 117 different HPV established types that had been requested so far. We believe that th this service is quite essential. It both facilitates an easy access for any author, for research, for key materials, of course, and we are also acting as a central repository and supporting the reproducibility and comparability of studies, as the authors can use the same material. The third main service that is the national reference HPV Reference Center supports, uh, provides, is supporting the International Animal Papillomavirus Reference Center. With the first service, I think I made it clear how we follow order and quality in HPV classification and taxonomy, how we follow the rules. But as I have read for animal papillomaviruses, it's another story. I Google CHPV1 which I always had thought that it was a papillomavirus from a chimpanzee, but that name belongs also to a goat virus. How can two dif a goat from a goat virus, how can two different viruses with different hosts share the same name? That's not okay. So, <laughs> that's not okay at all. And I, I believe that's one of the reasons why the International HPV Reference Center, together with the University of Arizona, will, as an international animal P, uh, papillomavirus reference center, will try to solve and put some quality and order in there for the animal papillomaviruses. 
the reference center, the, the human reference center, the HPV reference center, will provide the same services as we do for human papillomaviruses. We will do the confirmation of the DNA, the recloning and the, sequences, the sequencing in Sanger. And then we will give the results to the University of Arizona and those are the contacting point for the originating authors. We are, this uh, service started now in January 2019. That's when the previous, the publication here was accepted. So we are now starting, but we have the web page ready and we are waiting to get the clones and the sequences. The four main service that is um, yeah, described in the web page is the issuing of the international proficiency panels for HPV genotyping. I actually had to ask Karina <laughs> if this was part of the International HPV Reference Center because it's not coming from the International HPV Reference Center per se, but it's because we are also are the global HPV reference laboratory. But as Karina is doing the work, sometimes it's difficult to know <laughs> what comes from what. As we have described here, in 2005, WHO initiated a global HPV laboratory network. And that was with the objective to facilitate the development and the implementation of HPV vaccines by improving and standardizing the quality of HPV laboratory services. This comes from the belief that accurate and internationally comparable HPV DNA detection and typing is essential. In 2006, the Joachim Dierens Group was appointed as the Global HPV Reference Laboratory. And in 2008, the first proficiency study was conducted. This study, what, if, I, if I was to explain what we do in this study, is the e-swing of the international proficiency panels. Carina provides ISUS international proficiency panels to any laboratory that wants to participate in this study. What is that panel? The panel consists of coded, coded tubes with DNA from one or several genotypes, HPV genotypes. The laboratory that receives them has to type those tubes, but he, well, he, the laboratory does not know what the tubes contain. It's a blinded study. So the laboratory that types it will report the results to Karina. And this is the last paper that is published. And um, it reports the results from the panels issued in 2013 and 2014. And the title, and even in the title, you can already see that it's a continuing global improvement in HPV DNA genotyping services. I know that the panels were also issued in 2017. Karina is working on the, new, on the new paper and another proficiency study will be conducted now in 2019. I'm taking here the results that I borrowed from her. These are the, the percentage, the numbers that are bold in brackets, the uh, data sets that were 100 proficient. And these data sets correspond to the laboratories that have been um, taking part on all the proficiency studies. The result is quite clear. We come from a, well, 48, 29, 35% of proficiency, 100% proficiency to 73. Yes, all the details about the proficiency study are included in the web page together with the publications. And uh, apart from the four main services, we have also included different publications that we consider of interest. You, you can see peer-reviewed articles as well as reports. We have some webinars, uh, special importance to the e-learning course that we did on HPV, news and events of importance, and a section, of course, for any author with frequently asked questions. So I believe this is everything from the International HPV Reference Center. 
I would like to say thank you to Karina and for keeping the reference running.